time to get Connie over to the third platform. So, the small pink platform and the blue step aren't much use to her right now. But if we make the platform move backwards and forwards, she can hop onto it and cross over. To do that, we'll need a connector called a piston. Go to the assembly menu, then the gadgets menu. You'll find the piston in the connectors section. It's somewhere near the middle and looks like, well, a piston. Now that it's equipped on your imp, you can start connecting. First, press R2 or X to join it to the blue step, which is unmovable, so it's the parent object. I've put a yellow dot on it to show you the best place to connect it. Next, connect the blue end to the child object, which is the floating platform. See how grid snap keeps the connector perfectly straight? Hover over the blue dot, then press R2 or X. Remember, the child object is the part that needs to be able to move. So when you join a connector to its child, that object will automatically become movable. When you've placed the piston, press circle to unequip it. Click R3 to test the connector. That's more like it. The piston is now moving the platform back and forth. Rewind time with L3. Now Connie might not be too happy if we make her jump on that. So let's calm the piston down a bit. First, open the piston's tweak menu. Hover anywhere over it, hold L1 and press square. If the tweak menu blocks your view of the piston, you can grab it and move it with R2. This white gizmo shows the maximum length and speed of the piston. You can change the speed by adjusting the slider with the clock icon. That's the cycles per minute. Grab the slider by holding X over it with your imp and reduce the value. The further to the left you move, the faster the number will change. It doesn't need to be exact. Somewhere around 15 should do it. But if you want to get a more precise number, you can adjust the slider with the up and down directional buttons instead. Notice how it's slowed down now. Click R3 to see it moving the platform. When you're happy with the speed, close the tweak menu with the close button or use L1 and circle. Then rewind time with L3. Time to switch over to play mode and test out the scene so far. Make sure the platform isn't moving too fast for Connie to jump on. You can always go back to edit mode and tweak the piston until you're happy with it. Once Connie has made it all the way across, rewind time in edit mode and move on to the next step. There's just one more gap for Connie to cross. We have a plank and a step to attach it to. For the plank to drop down, we'll need it to pivot like a hinge, which means we'll need to use a bolt connector this time. Go into the connector section in the assembly menu. Select the icon with the nut on it. That's the bolt connector. Now you can connect it just like you did with the string and the piston. And because I'm so nice, I've placed some yellow and blue dots and a sneaky new purple one so that you can see where to make the connections. They're quite close together this time, so move in closer for a good view. Remember, you can use the grab cam on the R1 button to zoom in close. As always, connect the parent object first, the yellow dot. Then you can connect the child object, the blue dot. The grid snap will keep the bolt in a straight line so you don't have to worry about it. Once it's all connected, 
you can unequip the bolt connector using the circle button. You've probably noticed that there's a purple gizmo halfway along the bolt. That's the pivot which the bolt rotates around. Click R3 to see how it all works. Well, that's not right. It looks like we'll need to reposition the pivot to get the plank moving correctly. Click L3 to rewind time and reset the plank. Now go ahead and grab the purple gizmo with R2. Move it so it's by the purple dot. While you're grabbing the pivot gizmo with R2, press triangle to align it to the grid. Now grab it with L2 and use the sticks to rotate it so its axis goes through the bottom of the plank. The grid snap guide will help you line it up exactly. The child object, in this case the plank, will rotate around that axis. Once it's all lined up, switch over to play mode to test it out. If you've done it correctly, the plank should balance upright. Connie will need to push. Once it's guide will help align it to gizmo with R2. Position the pivot to get the plank moving correctly. Click L3 to rewind time and reset the plank. Now go ahead and grab the purple gizmo with R2. Move it so it's by the purple dot. While you're grabbing the pivot gizmo with R2, press triangle to align it to the grid. Now grab it with L2 and use the sticks to rotate it so its axis goes through the bottom of the plank. The grid snap guide will help you line it up exactly. The child object, in this case the plank, will rotate around that axis. Once it's all lined up, switch over to play mode to test it out. If you've done it correctly, the plank should balance upright. Connie will need to push the plank down, unless, of course, the plank isn't long enough. Oh well, switch back to edit mode and rewind time. We'll sort out the plank in the next step. To make sure Connie can reach the last platform, we could always make the plank longer, but that's a completely different tutorial. Instead, let's try restricting the bolt's movement. We can do that by giving it an angle limit. First, you'll need to bring up the bolt's tweak menu. So hover over any part of the bolt, hold L1 and press square. You should see the Use Limits button about halfway down. Select it with X. And look at that. Three handles have appeared. Two pale yellow ones and a longer pale blue one. The yellow ones set the range of movement, which is represented by the transparent arc between them. We need to move one of these yellow handles so it's just a little bit left of vertical. It should look like an 11 o'clock position. Now move the other yellow handle to a 3 o'clock position. If your handle doesn't line up exactly, just press triangle while you're grabbing it. This will realign the handle to the grid. The blue handle represents the position of the child object. So you need to line it up with the plank in the 12 o'clock position. Press triangle to realign the handle to the grid if necessary. You can close the tweak menu now and head into play mode to test the scene. If everything's working correctly, Connie should be able to reach Cuthbert. And if you feel like experimenting, you can try out some other connector types. See what you can come up with. Then, when you're done editing the scene, go through the door in play mode to finish this tutorial.
Looks like Cuthbert is in a spot of bother. Connie needs our help to get across these platforms so she can rescue Cuthbert. So how about we add a little handmade animation to get her there? You don't need to go into play mode to see that Connie won't be able to make this jump. So let's animate that floating ledge down to her using an action recorder. Action recorders are super easy to use. Just stamp one in your scene, and it will record anything you move with the imp. And we mean anything. It'll even record you moving or tweaking gadgets. We better get going. Connie's getting really impatient. You know what cones are like. Go to the assembly menu. Press the square button if it's not already open. Then head to the animate menu. The animate icon is a clappable. It looks like Cuthbert is in a spot of bother. Connie needs our help to get across these platforms so she can rescue Cuthbert. So how about we add a little handmade animation to get her there? You don't need to go into play mode to see that Connie won't be able to make this jump. So let's animate that floating ledge down to her using an action recorder. Action recorders are super easy to use. Just stamp one in your scene, and it will record anything you move with the imp. And we mean anything. It'll even record you moving or tweaking gadgets. We better get going. Connie's getting really impatient. You know what cones are like. Go to the assembly menu. Press the square button if it's not already open. Then head to the animate menu. The animate icon is a clapperboard. That thing they use in movies before the director says, action. Now you get to be the director, and you can use these tools and gadgets to animate objects. Select the action recorder, the icon with a film strip and a plus sign on it. You'll now have an action recorder gadget on your imp. Stamp it down somewhere near the floating ledge. Stamp it down, somewhere near the floating ledge. A progress bar will appear at the top of the screen, along with a record button on the right. Also, your imp will turn red. This means you're ready to start recording. Don't worry, recording won't start until you begin moving or changing things. When you're ready, grab the floating ledge with R2. Move it slowly towards Connie using the motion sensor function or the sticks. You'll notice that the bar starts to fill, recording your every move. Don't worry, it's not a time limit. The bar fills up as a visual indicator of something being recorded, so take your time. When you let go of R2, the recording will pause. If you move your view or use the grab cam, that won't be recorded. But if you've started time with R3, recording will continue when you let go of R2. That's why it's important to rewind or pause time before recording anything. That way, your action recorder only contains what you put into it. When you've finished recording, select the stop recording button in the context menu. Or you can use the shortcut, L1 and circle button to exit the action recorder. Your imp will go back to normal to show that recording has stopped. Click R3 to play back your animation. Handmade animations are always a bit wobbly, but practice makes perfect. 
Calibrating your imp can help when using the motion sensor function. Just hold your controller in a comfortable position, then hold the options button for a few seconds. In the next step, I'll show you how to edit a recorded animation. Anything you record is stored in the Action Recorder gadget. If you hover over the floating ledge, the Action Recorder will pulse. Select the Action Recorder with X, and dashed lines will appear on the objects animated with it. It'll also show the animation path. That's this dashed line. If you're not happy with your animation, redoing it is easy. First, Rewind time with L3. Then hover over the Action Recorder gadget, hold L1 and press X. Now we can start recording again. Select the Retake button in the context menu to replace the old animation. Now you can record a new one. Move the platform so it stops in front of Connie. You can undo actions you perform using the left directional button. But it won't undo any time that has passed. So it's better to use the retake button to undo animations. Move the floating ledge from the upper platform down to Connie. Don't worry if the animation's too slow or too fast. We can fix that later. Make sure you press the stop recording button when you're done. Spend a little time practicing with the action recorder. In the next step, I'll show you how to tweak your animation. Another way to edit animations is to tweak them. Hold L1 and press the square button over the Action Recorder gadget to open its tweak menu. Here you can see all the tweaks for the Action Recorder. By default, the playback mode is set to loop, so it plays the animation over and over again. But you can set them to play once, sustain, or to ping pong. Once will play the whole animation just one time. Sustain will play the animation for as long as the action recorder has power. If it loses power, it will stop. Then it will continue from that point when it's powered again. Ping Pong plays the animation forward once and then plays it in reverse. Then forward, then backwards and so on. That sounds like a good option for our floating ledge. Select Ping Pong with X. Click R3 to start time and play the animation. You can also change the animation speed to make it slower or faster. Grab the slider with X and use your imp to change the speed. If you want to explore more of the action recorder tweaks, you can. 
If you hover over any button for a few seconds, a more info tip will explain what that tweak does. To close the tweak menu, just hold L1 and press the circle button anywhere over it. And of course, you can undo any changes you make by pressing the left directional button. Switch to play mode to test your changes. When you're ready, come back to edit mode and start the next step. Now that Connie's made it up to the higher platform, how will she get back down to the next one? First, rewind time with L3. You probably already know about cloning objects, but do you know that you can clone their animations along with them? I'm sure you remember how to clone, but if not, just hold L1 and grab the ledge you animated with R2. Once you've made the clone, Release L1, then move the ledge to the other side, and release R2 to place it. Not only did you clone the ledge, but you also cloned its animation. Click R3 to start time. Now we just need to flip it so that it moves in the correct direction. First, make sure you rewind time. Grab the platform with R2. Then click L3 to flip it horizontally. Depending on where you grabbed it, you might have to move it closer to the other platform after flipping. You may also need to realign it with triangle before releasing R2 to put it back down. Now click R3 to start time and the platform should move in opposite directions. Both animations are stored in the same action recorder. So if you retake or delete the action recorder, it will affect both animations. Now go into play mode and see if Connie can make it across both gaps. Switch back to edit mode when you're ready to move on.
Now let's get Connie to Cuthbert and get them through the door before Cuthbert has a total meltdown. I've placed a shiny helper cube. Let's call it Cuthbot. That holds up the next platform, but it's not very animated at the moment. To get it to walk back and forth towards the exit, we need to use Record Possession. It allows you to possess puppets and record a performance with them. Open the assembly menu, then go to the animate menu. Select record possession. It's the button with the sock puppet icon. Your imp can now possess the puppets in the scene. In the context menu, you'll see the count in button. When this is selected, you'll get a three second count in before recording starts. Press R2 over the cuffbot to possess the puppet and start the countdown. When the count reaches zero, the possession recorder begins recording. Unlike the action recorder, it records constantly. So time will be recorded even when the cube isn't moving. Walk the cuffbot around the obstacles to the final platform. Pause for a moment, turn around, then walk back to where the cuffbot started. Starting and ending at the same place will help to make the animation loop smoothly. Press the circle button to depossess. You'll notice that the recording pauses when you depossess. Select Stop Recording in the context menu to exit the possession recorder. Once you've stopped recording, click L3 to rewind time, then R3 to start time, and watch what you've recorded. In the last step, I'll show you how to edit the recorded possession. You may have noticed a possession recorder gadget has appeared next to the cuffbot. When you're using record possession, this gadget appears the moment you press the stop recording button. Select it with X to view the animation path. The possession recorder gadget also lets you edit and tweak the animation. Hold L1 and press X over the possession recorder to scope in and edit it. Just like the action recorder, you can choose to retake the animation by selecting the button in the context menu. To stop editing the possession recorder, select stop recording in the context menu. Or hold L1 and press the circle button to quickly scope out. You can also tweak the possession recorder with L1 and the square button. It has exactly the same options as the action recorder. Experiment with the recorder and the different tweak options. Remember, you can see more info about the tweak settings by hovering over them for a few seconds. Close the tweak menu by pressing L1 and the circle button anywhere over it. Once you're done editing, switch over to play mode to test out the completed scene. Then Connie can navigate to the last platform and help Cuthbert through the door to complete the tutorial.
might be able to animate wobbly platforms with the action recorder, but keyframes are where animation gets serious. Nice try, Cuthbert, but leave the dream shaping to the experts. We're going to use keyframes to animate the platforms so Connie can reach the exit. A keyframe records any changes you make to an object, such as its position, tweak menu settings, or anything else you can think of. Then it stores those changes in a gadget that you can switch on and off. Okay, let's use keyframes to help Connie get across those platforms. First, go to the assembly menu. If it's closed, press the square button to open it. Look for the animate button, which has a clapperboard icon, and click on that. Start by selecting the keyframe gadget, which is the one with the diamond and the plus sign. Then stamp it in the scene above the first gap. You'll notice there's now a stop recording button in the context menu. And your imp now looks like a red keyframe. That means the keyframe gadget is recording any changes you make in the scene. But unlike the action recorder, it only records the state of things, not a period of time. It's probably easier to understand if we put it into practice. Let's try it on the block that's on the ground in front of Connie. Grab it with R2 and place it between the first two platforms. You'll see some dashed lines appear on the block. These tell you that the keyframe has recorded the change you've made to the object. You can move it as many times as you like. It'll only store the final result. If that's not the outcome you wanted, you can always undo your last change with the left directional button. The next bit is super important. To finish and store your changes in the keyframe, you need to select the stop recording button in the context menu. Select it now and see what happens. That's right, the block has snapped back to its original position. That's because the keyframe isn't active right now. But we can still see what's recorded by selecting the gadget with X. There, the block is back to where you moved it. You'll notice the keyframe doesn't record how things moved, just where they moved to. Make sure you deselect the keyframe before moving on. You can do that by pressing the circle button. In the next step, I'll show you how to use your keyframe in the scene. Now that you've recorded a keyframe, Let's look at how to activate it. See the trigger zone above the first platform? Select it with X to check its area of effect. Okay, it looks like the zone stretches across the whole gap. Deselect it with the circle button. Then use the sticks or the grab cam to move in closer to the gap. You'll notice an output port on its side, labelled Detected. This sends a signal when it detects a possessed puppet like Connie. We need to connect this to the keyframe. So select the port with R2 or X to create a wire. Then stretch it to the keyframe gadget with your imp and use R2 or X to connect the wire to the power port. Now the trigger zone signal will switch on the keyframe when it detects Connie. Try it out in play mode. Just press the options button and select the controller icon. See, as soon as Connie enters the trigger zone area, the block springs into place. Well, it works okay, but the animation's a bit fast, don't you think? We can do something about that after you take Connie across. 
Head back into edit mode, rewind time with L3, and I'll show you how to add smoothing to the keyframe in the next step. Okay then, we've made a simple keyframe animation. Now it's time to smooth it out and make it look better. Like almost everything in Dreams, keyframes can be tweaked. So open this one's tweak menu, hold L1, then press the square button over it. You'll see two sliders at the bottom, slow power up and slow power down. These determine how long it takes for the keyframe to turn on fully. Hover over the slow power up slider now and hold the X. Then move your imp to the right to increase the value. Let's set it to one second for now. You can set slow power down to any value you like. Then close the tweak menu by selecting the cross icon in the corner. Or you can hold L1 over the menu, then press the circle button. Let's see what that looks like in play mode. Ah yes, that looks a lot smoother. If you're happy with the new animation, switch back to edit mode. Rewind time with L3 and move on to the next step. It looks like the bridge across the next gap has collapsed. We could just move it back into place, but where's the fun in that? Let's perform a little bit of magic instead. Go to the assembly menu and select another keyframe from the animate menu. Stamp it above the gap with R2 or X. Now see if you can reassemble the bridge. Grab the first part and move it back where it should be. One of the great things about keyframes is that they can affect multiple objects. So you can put the other half of the bridge back too. Then select stop recording from the context menu to store your changes. Once recording stops, the bridge will go back to its original position. So, select the keyframe with X if you want to see those changes again. Hmm, I could have done a better job at positioning the bridge. Nothing to worry about though, because editing a keyframe is e easy. Just select the Edit Keyframe button in the context menu. It's got the same icon as a keyframe gadget. This allows you to make changes to the keyframe. You can remove things from a keyframe by pressing the triangle button over them. And now the bridges are back on the ground. Let's put them back into place, but this time, make sure they're a bit straighter. Remember, when you're grabbing things, you can realign them by pressing the triangle button. There we go. Much better. You can select stop recording again to finish editing this keyframe. Then move on to the next step when your bridge is in place. The bridge's new position is already stored in the keyframe, so all we need now is a way to act Activate it. That's where this trigger zone will come in handy. Let's select it to see what zone it covers. Hmm, it's not in the gap this time. It's over this button. First, create a wire from the trigger zone's output using R2 or X. Then stretch it over to the keyframe and connect it to its power port. When Connie steps on the button now, the keyframe will be switched on. 
But what happens when she leaves the trigger zone? Let's test it in play mode to find out. Just as I thought. When Connie moves away, the keyframe switches off. Let's head back to edit mode and see what we can do about that. Of course, we could just move the trigger zone into the gap, but this is an animation tutorial. So let's see if we can use the keyframes tweak menu to fix the problem. Open it now with the L1 and square button shortcut and have a look at the options there. Hovering over the buttons will bring up their names. The one we're interested in is called Keep Changes. With this option turned on, any changes made by the animation will be permanent. So once Connie activates the keyframe, the bridge will stay in its new position until you rewind the scene. Since we're already in the tweak menu, let's add some smoothing to that animation. I think I'll set it to two seconds this time. Okay, time to close the tweak menu with L1 and the circle button. Then try out these changes in play mode. How's that for a magic trick? You can switch back to edit mode, rewind time, and experiment with the keyframe to see what else you can do. Maybe you could try keyframing a tweak menu setting or animating some elements from the tutorial collection. When you're done, move on to the next step and I'll show you how to use keyframes on a timeline. Keyframes are great for making simple animations. But if you want to make something more complex, you need a timeline. See that little block floating between the last two platforms? Let's use keyframes on a timeline to animate it. Start by selecting a timeline from the Animate menu. Stamp it down somewhere around the last gap. Then you can use the circle button to unequip the gadget. Now open the timeline, hold L1 over it and press X. This is the timeline canvas. You can move the canvas with your imp by grabbing it with R2. The numbers along the top are seconds, and you can see it's set to 8 seconds by default. If you grab the edges with X, you can extend or shorten the canvas. Try setting it to around 6 seconds. If you ever need extra space to add more things, you can also extend the bottom of the timeline. Once you're comfortable with moving and resizing the timeline canvas, move on to the next step and we'll start adding things to it. Now, it's time to animate the floating block. Get a new keyframe from the animate menu and stamp it in the scene. Now grab and move the block to its starting position at the edge of the platform where Cuthbert's waiting. Once the block's in place, remember to press the stop recording button in the context menu. Now, grab the keyframe gadget and move it over the timeline. The gadget will snap to it. Place it at the very start of the timeline. Then get another keyframe from the animate menu. We'll use this one to record the block's second position. This time, stamp the keyframe directly onto the timeline. Around the two second mark is good, on the same row as the first keyframe. Move the floating block to the opposite side of the gap. Now stop recording. Hover over the timeline canvas and play controls will appear. Using these controls, you can preview just the timeline 
without playing the rest of the scene. Select the play button to preview your animation. As you can see, gadgets are only active when the timeline's playhead is over them. So, when neither of the keyframes are switched on, the block goes right back to its original position. Now we need to edit the animation so the first keyframe blends into the second. To do that, open the first keyframe's tweak menu with L1 and the square button. Now that the keyframe is on a timeline, the buttons that were grayed out before are available. These are blend types, and they change how one keyframe merges into the next. Select the linear button, which will blend to the next keyframe at a constant speed. If you press the timeline's play button now, you'll see the platform move smoothly between the keyframe's positions. Feel free to try out other blend types and see how they affect the animation. Then move on to the next step when you're ready. We've got the platform moving smoothly now, but we can still improve how it works. Let's begin by making it pause for a moment at the start and finish, so Connie has an easier time getting on. All we have to do is scale the keyframes on the timeline so they last longer. You might want to get up close to the first keyframe before we start. Now, with your imp over the keyframe, hold the up directional button to extend it. Then do the same with the second keyframe. Now that the keyframes are longer, the blend has become quicker. You can see it for yourself by selecting the play button under the timeline. If you want to scale a keyframe more precisely, you can do that with its trim handles. Trim handles are the dotted lines at the beginning and end of keyframes. Grab them now with R2 to give it a try. We should get the platform back to where it started now. But instead of adding a new keyframe, we're going to clone the first one. You remember how to clone things, right? Just hold L1 and grab the first keyframe with R2. Now drag it past the second keyframe and place it by releasing R2. Now we just need to add the blending between the last two keyframes. Only this time, we'll use a shortcut instead of the tweak menu. Just hover over the space between those keyframes, then hold L1 and press X. There you go, one linear blend added. You can even cycle through different blend types by keeping L1 held and pressing X again. I love shortcuts, because I'm lazy. Use the play controls on the timeline to preview the animation. Move on to the final step when you're ready to continue. Now, because there's some space at the end of the timeline where none of the keyframes are active, the platform just snaps right back to its original position. There's a few ways we could fix this. For example, we could shorten the timeline so there's no gap at the end. We could also lengthen the keyframe animation so it fills up the whole timeline. Or, we could turn on Keep Changes in the last keyframe's tweak menu. The last step is tweaking the timeline itself. So, Hold L1 anywhere over it, then press the square button to see all of its properties. The playback speed makes it go faster or slower. But what we're interested in right now is the playback mode. When it's set to once, the whole timeline will play, even if it was only powered for a split second. 
When it's set to sustain, it will only play when it has constant power. It will stop when it loses power, then resume from that point if it's turned on again. And if it's set to loop, it will repeat over and over as long as it has power. That sounds like the best option for this timeline, so select that one. Okay, it looks like we're good to go. You can close the timeline now by selecting the cross icon in the top right corner. Or you can hold L1 over the timeline itself, then press the circle button. Click. When things don't sound the way they should, it can ruin the experience of playing. Don't worry, Cuthbert. The Dreamiverse contains heaps of ready-made sounds for us to use. First, let's switch over to play mode and see how it all sounds at the moment. Hmm, quiet, isn't it? Doesn't feel quite right. In fact, it's creeping me out, so let's head back into edit mode. Switch over to sound mode so we can start adding some sounds. Find the modes menu. It's inside the assembly menu. As you can see, there are lots of different modes. Each has its own set of tools for doing different things. We're currently in assembly mode. If you select the speaker symbol icon with X, we'll switch to sound mode. That's better. In the next step, we'll start adding sounds to the scene. Okay, the first thing we need to do is to start adding some background sounds. See the button with the magnifying glass in the sound menu? That's the search menu. Select it now to view the different types of sounds you can add. Now select the speaker button to search for sound effects. This is the Dreamiverse, where you can find all the wonderful stuff other dreamers have made. I've already set aside a collection of sound effects for you in here. That's what this collection is. It's bursting with different sound effects for you to play with. Select it with X to open it. I've arranged the sound effects into groups for you. To get a proper overview, use the right stick to zoom in and out of the collection. This group of sound effects are background sounds. You can hear a preview of each sound by hovering over them with your imp. Find something that fits the dreamy atmosphere of the scene. I rather like dream space. When you've found a sound you like, select it with X. The sound you selected now appears as a gadget on your imp. You can stamp it into your scene with R2, any place you like. It doesn't matter where you put it, because background sounds can be heard everywhere in a scene. Now let's start time with R3, and see how it all sounds. Ah, that's better. Notice how much more alive the scene feels with just that one sound. Imagine how it will feel with even more sound effects. But there's no need to imagine it. 
You can start adding more now to create a layered and unique ambience. If you want to replace a sound effect, just stamp a different one over it. When you've got things sounding just how you want them, rewind time with L3 and move on to the next step. Background sounds really help to create an immersive atmosphere. But to add sound to a specific object in the scene, you need to use what we call a spot sound. Let's try it out on the fire between the platforms. I'm sure we can find some fire sound effects in the collection. Let's take a look. Select search sound effects from the sound menu. As we open the tutorial collection in the last step, it's still open when we come back to the Dreamiverse. Isn't that handy? Ah, just what we need, some fire sound effects. Have a listen to some of the fire sounds and pick one you like. Once you've selected it, your imp will be equipped with a spot sound effect. See those rings coming off the gadget? That's the sound's fade zone. The rings show you how the sound fades away as you move further from the source. Let's stamp that sound between the first two platforms. Put it above the fire and see what that sounds like. If you want to see the sound's fade zone, select the gadget with X. Click R3 to listen to the sound effect. You'll notice the sound gets louder the closer you get to it. Aha! You can almost feel that fire. Toasty. As you move away, out of the fade zone, it gets quieter until eventually you can't hear it at all. You can press the circle button now to deselect the sound effect. Then click L3 to rewind the scene. If you're happy with your spot sound, move on to the next step. Things haven't been that tricky for Connie so far, but the next gap looks a bit too big, even with her mighty jumping skills. Let's fly over to that floating platform using the left and right sticks and get a closer look at it. Looks like there's a trigger zone attached to it. Why don't we switch over to play mode and see what it does. Well, will you look at that? It lights up the platform when Connie steps on it. Lovely. You know what would make it even better, though? If it made a sound as well. So let's switch back to edit mode and make that happen. I've got a feeling you can find something in the tutorial collection to use here. Go to the assembly menu and go back into sound mode. Now go to search and select search sound effects. Over here are some energy sound effects. Have a listen to a few. Pick a sound effect for your light up platform. I quite like the sound of Dream Terminal. See which one you like and select it with X. Now it's time to stamp it in the scene somewhere near the platform. In the next step, I'll show you how to trigger the sound effect. As we've already seen, background and spot sounds will play constantly when placed in the scene like this. But for the platform, we want the sound to be triggered by Connie. And for that to happen, we need to connect the sound effect to the same trigger zone 
that activates the glow. Move in closer to the platform using the left and right sticks. Take a good look at the trigger zone gadget. Do you see the output port that says detected when you hover over it? That means it will trigger when it detects a possessed puppet like Connie. So all we need to do to make the sound effect activate when Connie's on the platform is connect the output to the sound effect. Let's do that now. When you select the detected port with R2 or X, you'll see your imp becomes tethered to the port by a wire. Gadgets communicate with each other using wires like this. You'll also notice that a power port has appeared on the bottom of the sound effect gadget. To connect the two gadgets, just hover over that power port and press R2 or X. Time to head into play mode to see how it sounds. When you're ready, switch back to edit mode and start the next step. Oh, I just realized something. We got so caught up with these sound effects, we forgot to add another platform for Connie. She must be getting impatient. Sort that out for her. The easiest thing to do would be to clone the platform. Remember how to do that? Just hover over it, hold L1, and press and hold R2. Once the clone has been created, let go of L1, move it to the right spot, then release R2 to place it down. When you clone an object, any gadgets attached to it will come along for the ride. So all you need to do now is to wire the trigger zone on the second platform to the sound effect. Or even better, grab a new sound effect from the collection, just for variety. It's up to you. Dream Shapers should always go with their instincts. Whatever you choose to do, move on to the next step when you're ready. All right, there's just one more gap for Connie to cross before she reaches the door. That pink cylinder would make a great stepping stone for her, but it's all the way down in the water. If you take a closer look at it, you'll see there's a trigger zone and a movement sensor on it. They're not connected to anything right now. There's also a keyframe on the platform. I wonder what that does. Try selecting it with X to find out. Just as I thought. It raises the cylinder so Connie can use it to cross over. Press the circle button to deselect the keyframe. Looks like all we need to do is connect the cylinder's trigger zone to the keyframe, so it moves up when she gets close. And while we're doing that, why not add a sound effect to it as well? Let's jump back into the sound effects collection and see if there's anything appropriate in there. Down here, we've got some mechanical sound effect loops. These are the perfect sound effects for any sort of machinery in a scene. Hmm, we want something that would go well with a raising platform. I think I'll go for the heavy metal ratchet loop. That sounds good, right? Okay, now select the sound effect of your choice and stamp it near the pink cylinder with R2 or X. In the next step, I'll show you how to connect all of the gadgets. Now we just need to do a little bit of wiring to get everything working. Remember, the trigger zone will activate when it detects Connie, triggering the keyframe to raise the platform. Grab
Grab the detected output from the trigger zone with R2 or X. Then stretch the wire to the keyframe gadget and connect it to its power port with R2 or X. Now let's get the sound effect working. This will be triggered by the movement sensor. The movement sensor detects when the object it's attached to is moving. So when the platform starts rising, the movement sensor will send a signal from its output port. That's the output port on the right side of the movement sensor gadget. It's called velocity overall. Press R2 or X over the port to create a wire. You'll need to connect the other end of the wire to the sound effects power port. Once that's done, switch over to play mode to test everything out. tutorial is all about making music. Music can make your creations come alive, adding emotion and atmosphere. In dreams, you can compose whole tracks from scratch and even make your own instruments. But you don't need to be a maestro to start making your own music. I'll show you how to create an arrangement using ready-made music clips. So let's begin. To start making music, we need to switch over to sound mode. Right now, you're in assembly mode. If you're ever unsure of what mode you're in, just hover over the icon in the top left corner to see your current mode and tool. Go to the assembly menu and open the modes menu with X. The modes menu is where you access all the different creation modes. Each mode has its own set of tools and options. The button for sound mode has a speaker symbol on it. Select it with X. Now you have a new menu at the top of the screen. This is the sound menu. It contains everything you need to make your own music. In the scene, you'll see a timeline gadget. In the next step, I'll show you how to edit it. Music in Dreams is arranged in timelines. This timeline contains a version of the music you heard at the start of this tutorial. To see what's inside it, we need to open its canvas. Hover your imp over the timeline, hold L1 and press X to open it. It's just like scoping into a group. This is the timeline canvas. The canvas exists within scene space, so if you pull down on the left stick, you'll back away from it. Hold the L1 button and use the left stick to move up and down the timeline. This is the best way to navigate around timelines, especially when they're big. This piece of music is called Connie's theme. To listen to it, just start time by clicking R3. See how the piece is composed of many music clips. The clips power on and off as the playhead passes over them. Click R3 again to pause time. Each music clip is a collection of notes made by an instrument. You can grab them and move them around with your imp. If you want to delete a music clip, Hover over it and press the triangle button. Clips can also be cloned by holding L1 when you grab them. You can extend the timeline by hovering over one of its edges and holding X. The edge glows and an arrow icon appears. 
You can also extend the bottom if you need space for more clips. Once you've finished listening to the piece, click L3 to rewind time. You can find all sorts of different music by searching the Dreamiverse. To add music to one of your scenes, you could simply stamp a ready-made timeline, like this one. But in this tutorial, you'll learn how to assemble your own track from ready-made music clips. Move on to the next step and we'll get started. So, let's start making music. It's actually a lot easier than you might think. Close the timeline by selecting the cross button in the top right corner. Or hover over it Hold L1 and press circle to close it. Now delete the timeline by hovering over it with your imp and pressing triangle. Let's add a new music timeline to the scene. Press square to open the sound menu. Select the music timeline button in the menu, then stamp one in the scene with R2 or X. Press circle to unequip the timeline gadget from your imp. Open up the timeline canvas with L1 and X. This timeline is empty, ready to be filled with music. The columns on the timeline represent musical bars. This timeline is eight bars long. We'll need more space than that so hover over the right edge and grab it with X. Extend the timeline to 16 bars. Now let's add a music clip to the timeline. Press square to open the sound menu. Find the search button and select it with X. Its icon is the magnifying glass. When you search in sound mode, there are four options for finding different sounds. Select search music clips with X. This is the Dreamiverse. Here you can find music made by other dream shapers. Well, usually you can, but for this tutorial, I've made a collection of elements for you to use. That's what this cluster is. Select it with X to open it. It contains a selection of music clips, which you can use to build your own arrangements. Use the right stick to zoom in and out, and the left stick to move around. I've grouped the clips into different categories. Let's start with a basic melody. That's this group of clips. Hover over the clips to hear a preview of how they sound. Find one that you like, then select it with X to equip it to your imp. I'm using the clip Nostalgia Bells. Your imp will now be holding a gadget containing your selected clip. If you hover over the timeline, the gadget should snap to the canvas and re reveal the whole clip. Place the clip at the start of the timeline and stamp it with R2 or X. Clips on a timeline will snap to the bars and to other clips. This will help you line them up. Click R3 to listen to the timeline. In the next step, we'll build up the track with some more clips. Click L3 to rewind time. Let's build on the melody by adding some When you hover over a clip on the timeline, you'll see. To make the track play constantly in the scene, we need to set the timeline to Switch over to play mode and listen to your track in the scene. To end the tutorial, 
Just press options and select the exit creation button. Connie's hosting a talent contest to find the best characters in the Dreamiverse. But she's a no-nonsense judge and none of these candidates are up to scratch. Of course, Cuthbert's no use. So let's see if we can come up with something to impress her. Head into the dressing room, also known as edit mode, to get started. In this tutorial, we'll be customizing the appearance of a puppet. So we'll need a blank canvas to start. Go to the assembly menu and open the gadgets menu. Now open the gameplay gear menu. In here, find the blank puppet deluxe. The deluxe version is the perfect starting point for making characters. Select it with X and a blue mannequin will appear on your imp. It has built-in features like jump and possession animations, which the basic version doesn't have. Connie won't be impressed by a basic puppet, so make sure you select the right one. Stamp the deluxe puppet in the scene with R2 or X. Get its feet roughly on the floor, but make sure they aren't intersecting with it. Then press the circle button to unequip the puppet from your imp. If you need to, you can grab and adjust the puppet with R2. In the next step, we'll start exploring the puppet's inner workings. The puppet might look simple, but it's quite a complex gadget. So let's get to know it a little better. It's made up of many objects that have been grouped together. And just like any other group, it can be scoped into. Hover over the puppet with your imp, press and hold L1, and then press X to scope in. Below the puppet, you will now see its base and its logic microchip. If they're obscured by the floor, you may need to scope out and adjust your puppet's position. The puppet's body is made of sculptures, joined together with connectors. When scoped in, we can grab parts of the puppet to change its pose. Before we do that, find the button called Puppet Mirror in the context menu. Select this button with X, and your puppet will stay symmetrical when you pose it. Of course, you don't have to make it symmetrical, but it's a good way to start. You can always add nuance later. When you move a part of the puppet, all the parts connected to it will also move. The root of the puppet is the pelvis, and every other part is connected in a hierarchy from there. For example, moving the upper arm will move the lower arm and the hand as well. But if you move the pelvis, 
the whole puppet will move. Its feet will try to stay in contact with the floor. So if you lower the pelvis, the puppet's knees will bend. You can also rotate parts by grabbing them with L2. Use R2 and L2 to create a new pose for the puppet. Changing the pose can be a great starting point for a character. The pose could be confident, sad, scared, or aggressive. Don't forget, you can undo any changes with the left directional button if you make a mistake. Use the grab cam to adjust your pose from different angles. Just hold R1 over the puppet to activate it. When you've finished posing your puppet, move on to the next step. Now we've posed our puppet, we can start adjusting its proportions. To do that, we're going to use the stretch tool. Go to the assembly menu, then open the tools menu. Select the stretch tool. It's the one that looks like a double-ended arrow. The stretch tool works like the move tool in a lot of ways. But with the stretch tool, you can move parts of the puppet beyond the limits of the connectors. Try grabbing and moving the puppet's head. Notice the way the neck elongates and shortens. Now try it on the hands. This changes the length of the upper and lower arm. Some body parts respond differently to the stretch tool. For instance, if you move the upper arms, the shoulders will broaden and the chest will expand. You can also scale parts of the puppet using the up and down directional buttons. I'd only recommend doing this to the puppet's extremities though, the head, hands and feet. Puppets are delicate contraptions and extreme scaling and stretching can make them behave unexpectedly. But if anything does go skew with, just undo it using the left directional button. If you know how to use sculpt mode, you could try scoping into the individual body parts to change their shape. You can find a whole tutorial on sculpting in the art tutorials. Have a play around with stretching and scaling and see what you can create. Try making the puppet more cartoony or turn it into a monster. Test out your puppet in play mode to see it in motion. When you're done, return to edit mode. Rewind time with L3 to get your puppet back in position. In the next step, I'll show you how to color and stylize your puppet.
Another way of customizing your puppet's appearance is by changing its color. We can do this by tinting it in coat mode. If you've played my tutorial on coat, style and effects, you'll already know how to do this. In the assembly menu, go to the modes menu and enter coat mode. In the coat mode menu, open the colors menu and select a color for your puppet. Now hover over your puppet and hold R2 to tint it with your selected color. The longer you hold R2, the stronger the tint will become. If you want your puppet to be multicolored, simply scope into the puppet. Select a different color from the colors menu. Hover your imp over a part of the puppet you want to tint. How about the head? Now, when you press and hold R2, just that part of the puppet will be tinted. You can also use the tools in style mode and effects mode. Try using style mode to change the texture of your puppet. If you don't know how to use style mode, there's an art tutorial which can help you. In the next step, we'll dive into the dressing up box. One of the simplest ways to customize a puppet is by adding accessories. But to make sure they move with the puppet, we need to group them with a body part. Before we do that, it's important to fully understand the concept of scoping in and out of groups and objects. If you've played part four of the Start Dreaming tutorials, then you'll already know a thing or two about using groups. Objects in dreams are often combined into groups which can be treated like a single object in assembly mode. Groups themselves can also be grouped. This means that you can have groups nested inside other groups. Let's try scoping in and out of something else before we invade the pu puppet's personal space. Over there on the floor is a hat box. Make sure you're in edit mode. Now try taking the lid off the hat box. The whole box will move because the lid, the box, and its contents have been grouped. Undo the move with the left directional button to put it back in its place. Now scope into the group. Hover over the hat box, press and hold L1, and press X. Everything but the box should go gray and blurry. If not, Make sure your visual feedback preference is set to all. This shows that you've scoped into the group and can edit its contents. Now, you should be able to take the lid off the hat box. Inside is another hat box. Try taking the lid off this one. I think you can guess what will happen. This smaller hat box is also grouped with its lid and contents. Remove the smaller box and place it next to the large one. Now scope into this group by holding L1 and pressing X over the smaller hat box. The original hat box will go gray and blurry as we've scoped into a subgroup. Now you should be able to open the smaller hat box. What's inside? A lovely hat! 
Take it out and place it next to the smaller box. When you've done that, proceed to the next step. Now that we've taken the hat out of the box, let's try putting it on our puppet. First, we need to scope out of this group. To do that, simply hold L1 and press circle. That takes us back into the large hat box group. Now scope out again into the main scene by holding L1 and pressing circle. Pick up the hat. Ah, we seem to have a bit of a problem here. The hat is still inside the nested groups, even though it's outside the hat box. When you scope in and out, only you and your imp are moving in and out of objects or groups. Unless you're carrying something with you. Scope back into the large hat box group, and then into the smaller hat box group to get the hat. Now grab and hold the hat with R2, and scope out of both groups with L1 and circle while holding the hat. If you've done it correctly, you should be back in the main scene, with a hat you can now move independently of the boxes. That's because scoping in and out of a group whilst holding an object adds or removes it from that group. Hurrah! Now we can put it on the puppet. Grab the hat, hover over the puppet, then hold L1 and press X to scope into the puppet with the hat. Now scope into the puppet's head while still holding the hat. This is a shortcut for grouping two objects if you're already grabbing one of them. Simply grab an object and scope into another object to group them automatically without having to select them. The same way that scoping into a group while holding an object adds it to the group. Now that it's in a group with the head, place the hat where you want it. Remember to check it from different angles using the grab cam. Now we can put it on the puppet. Grab the hat, hover over If you've done it correctly, grab scope. Oh, 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 bit of a problem here. The hat is still inside the nested groups, even though it's outside the hat box. When you scope in and out, only you and your imp are moving in and out of objects or groups. Unless you're carrying something with you. Scope back into the large hat box group and then into the smaller hat box group to get the hat. Now grab and hold the hat with R2 and scope out of both groups with L1 and circle while holding the hat. If you've done it correctly, you should be back in the main scene with a hat you can now move independently of the boxes. That's because scoping in and out of a group whilst holding an object adds or removes it from that group. Hurrah! Now we can put it on the puppet. Grab the hat, hover over the puppet, then hold L1 and press X to scope into the puppet with the hat. Now scope into the puppet's head while still holding the hat. This is a shortcut for grouping two objects if you're already grabbing one of them. Simply grab an object and scope into another object to group them automatically without having to select them. The same way that scoping into a group while holding an object adds it to the group. Now that it's in a group with the head, place the hat where you want it. Remember to check it from different angles using the grab cam to make sure it's in position. Press R2 softly to nudge if you need to make fine adjustments to the position of the hat. Before you move on, 
You should try out the puppet to see it walk around with its new accessory. Switch to play mode, possess it with R2, and take it for a wonder. Nice. When you're ready to continue, go back to edit mode. Going to play mode and back to edit mode will scope you out of any groups. Remember to rewind time with L3 to get your puppet back in position. Then go to the next step. Okay, let's add some more accessories before our puppet's stage debut. Open the assembly menu and select search, the button with the magnifying glass, to search for an element. Usually, you'd be in the Dreamiverse here, but for this tutorial, I've kept things simple and curated a collection of elements for you to use. Take a look at some of the accessories in the collection. Select one you like with X. You'll now have your chosen accessory on your imp. Don't stamp it down yet, though. First, we need to scope into the puppet. You can do this even when you have an element from the Dreamiverse on your imp. Scope in with L1 and X, and then scope into the body part that you want to attach it to. If that body part is already in its own group, you'll enter that group. But if the body part is just a sculpture, then you'll create a new group when you stamp the object down. Once the accessory is in the group, you can adjust the accessory while you're there. Try adding some more accessories from the collection. Then it's important to test the puppet in play mode to check that the accessory is attached correctly. Here's another very important tip. If you ever want to remove an accessory, whatever you do, don't ungroup the body part. If you do that, you'll delete that group's connection to the puppet. And without the connector, your puppet's limbs will start falling off when you go into play mode. And nobody wants that. Instead, scope into the group containing the body part and the accessory. Then either delete the accessory or grab it and scope out. If there's only one object left in the group, it'll automatically ungroup and the connector will remain safely connected to the remaining object. Play around with the things you've learned in this tutorial and have fun making a character. When you're happy, select the star podium from the tutorial collection and stamp it down in the outline that we've put in the scene for you. Then head back into play mode, jump onto the podium and see what Connie thinks of your creation. When you're happy, Select the star podium from the tutorial collection and stamp it down in the outline that we've put in the scene for you. Then head back into play mode, jump onto the podium and see what Connie thinks of your creation.
Oh dear. It looks like Cuthbert is really stuck this time. In previous tutorials, you've edited the scene to help Connie reach Cuthbert. But this time, you'll be editing Connie herself, supercharging her with some new abilities to get past the obstacles in the scene. Bear in mind that this is a complex tutorial in which it's easy to make a mistake. If you do, remember to use the left directional button to undo. Now go into play mode and see how, how far you can get. Possess Connie with R2 and press the X button to jump. Oops, she can't even get over the first obstacle. So let's start by souping up her jump height. Switch back to edit mode and we'll get started. To change Connie's jump height, all we need to do is tweak her. So hover over her, hold L1 and press the square button to open her tweak menu. This is a puppet tweak menu. As you can see, it's jam-packed with different options. Thankfully, the setting we want is on the first page. All these settings control Connie's overall movement. We could make Connie run super fast or super slow, but nah, that's not going to help her. A nice high jump is what we need. What do we have here? This slider controls Connie's jump height. Hover over it with your imp and hold X to grab it. Move your imp to adjust the slider to around 3 meters. That should be enough to get over that stack of blocks. Oh dear, it looks like Cuthbert is really stuck this time. In previous tutorials, you've edited the scene to help Connie reach Cuthbert. But this time, you'll be editing Connie herself, supercharging her with some new abilities to get past the obstacles in the scene. Bear in mind that this is a complex tutorial in which it's easy to make a mistake. If you do, remember to use the left directional button to undo. Now go into play mode and see how far you can get. Possess Connie with R2 and press the X button to jump. Oops, she can't even get over the first obstacle. So let's start by souping up her jump height. Switch back to edit mode and we'll get started. To change Connie's jump height, all we need to do is tweak her. So hover over her, hold L1 and press the square button to open her tweak menu. This is a puppet tweak menu. As you can see, it's jam packed with different options. Thankfully, the setting we want is on the first page. All these settings control Connie's overall movement. We could make Connie run super fast or super slow, but nah, that's not gonna help her. A nice high jump is what we need. What do we have here? This slider controls Connie's jump height. Hover over it with your imp and hold X to grab it. Move your imp to adjust the slider to around 3 meters. That should be enough to get over that stack of blocks. The Puppet Tweak menu also has some really useful testing controls. Click R3 to start time and Connie will come to life. See what happens now if you hover your imp over the jump height slider. You can preview the jump, so you can get it to the perfect height without having to test it in play mode. Actually, I think you should dial it back to two and a half meters, or she might overshoot the jump. You can make small adjustments to sliders by using the up and down directional buttons. Hover over the slider and use the down directional button to adjust the setting. Feel free to explore some of the other settings in the menu. If you're not sure what a button or slider does, 
Just hover over it for a few seconds and a more info tip will pop up to explain. You can even adjust the strength of gravity on her jump. Turn it down a bit to make her jump more floaty. When you've got Connie's jump the way you want it, give it a test run in play mode. See how far Connie can get now. Then move on to the next step when you're ready to continue. Well, that was pretty cool. Unfortunately, Connie's new jumping skills aren't going to be much use on the next obstacle. And don't even think about making her jump over the top, because that force field will zap her in a second. Instead, let's give Connie the power to crouch. I bet she's always dreamed of it. If you're still in play mode, switch back to edit mode now. Rewind time with L3 to put Connie back at the start. To give her a crouch, we need to scope into her. Puppets are made up of sculptures, connectors, and gadgets that are grouped together. Hover over Connie, press and hold L1, then press X to scope in. When you've scoped into a puppet, you can see its inner workings. On Connie's back, there's a microchip gadget. It's called Connie's brain, and it contains all her logic and animations. Let's take a look inside. Hold L1 and press X over it to scope in and open the microchip canvas. There's quite a lot going on in here. The gadget I want you to look at is this one in the bottom right corner with the diamond icon. This is a keyframe gadget. If you've played through the keyframes and timelines tutorial, you'll already know all about these. Keyframes record changes to things in the scene. They store those changes in a gadget, which can be triggered using logic. This keyframe contains a crouching pose for Connie. Select the keyframe with X, and you'll see a preview of how it looks. Those dashed lines over Connie show that she's being changed by the keyframe. Press circle to deselect the keyframe, and she goes back to normal. To be able to activate the crouch keyframe, we need to connect it to Connie's controller sensor. Then you'll be able to make her crouch with a controller button. In the next step, I'll show you how to do exactly that. To activate the crouch, we're going to connect it to Connie's controller sensor. If you've closed her microchip, scope back into her and then scope into the microchip to open it up again. The controller sensor is the large gadget on Connie's microchip. It has a controller icon on it. Open up its tweak menu with L1 and square. Now you have a microchip and a tweak menu open, you may need to arrange them on the screen. Make sure that the controller sensor and its tweak menu stay to the left. This is because they generate signals, and signals flow through gadgets from left to right in Dreams. You can also save the 3D space position of tweak menus and microchips, or pin them to the screen, using the buttons that appear at the top when hovering over the canvas. This will help you keep them tidy while you're editing logic, which is very important, as it's easy to make mistakes. Now, let's take a closer look at that controller sensor. Ah, look. Controller buttons. Just what we need. All playable characters contain a controller sensor gadget like this one. But the gadget can also be used for any situation where you want to detect button presses. To assign our keyframe to a button, we just need to wire it to the controller sensor. We won't use a circle button as that depossesses Connie, and X makes her jump. So how about the square button to crouch? 
Make sure you can see the keyframe on the microchip. Move the tweak menu with R2 if you need to. If you hover over the square button in the controller sensor menu, you'll see ports appear on either side of it. They're just like the ports you see on gadgets. Ports on the left are inputs, and ports on the right are outputs. Now, you need to be very precise for the next part, as it's easy to make a mistake. Carefully hover your imp over the output port of the square button, and press X to create a wire. Stretch that wire over to the keyframe, and connect it to the power port on the bottom of the gadget with X. If at any time you make a mistake, just undo it using the left directional button. Once your crouch move is all wired up, close the controller sensor tweak menu. Hover over it, hold L1, then press circle to close. Now try out Connie's new crouch in play mode. See if she can make it under the second obstacle. When you're ready to continue, go back to edit mode. Rewind time with L3 and start the ne next step. Right, we're on to the final obstacle. There's no way around it, but it looks destructible. So we're going to make a slam attack for Connie so that she can smash through it. We'll start by recording a pose for the slam. We can do this using a keyframe. Scope back into Connie and open up her microchip if it isn't already open. If you've played my keyframes and timelines tutorial, you'll have a bit of a head start on this next part. Go to the assembly menu and open the animate menu. Select the keyframe with X. You'll now have a keyframe gadget on your imp. Stamp it somewhere in the scene with R2 or X. The keyframe records changes you make to objects and settings in the scene. It starts recording as soon as you stamp it. You can tell it's recording because your imp will change shape and color. Now that we're recording, grab Connie's upper body with R2 and drag it gently down to the floor. Because we're scoped into her, we can move her body parts individually to create a pose. If we weren't scoped in, we'd move Connie's whole body. Notice that her knees automatically bend. Make sure her cone is all the way down to the floor so that you can't see her legs. Keyframes can record changes to anything, even tweak menu settings. So, just for visual flair, let's also make her glow. Hover over Connie's cone, hold L1 and press square to open its tweak menu. Because we're scoped in, this opens the tweak menu for the sculpture itself, rather than the puppet. All the settings on this page change the way Connie's cone looks. Look for the glow slider on the first page. Its icon is a sun. Raise the glow up to about 40%. Once you've set the glow, select stop recording in the context menu to store the changes to the keyframe. You can close the tweak menu now too. Just hover over it, hold L1, and press circle. Select the keyframe gadget with X to preview what's been recorded. Looks good. Deselect the keyframe by pressing circle. In the next step, we'll continue building Connie's slam attack. The next step is to place our new Connie animation into a timeline. Using a timeline will let us time the animations and effects of the slam attack. Go to the assembly menu and back to the animate menu. Select the timeline with X. Hover over Connie's microchip and stamp a timeline above the crouch keyframe. Now let's open the timeline canvas with L1 and X. The slam attack should be a really quick animation. 
So adjust the canvas so it's only one second long. Any longer and it won't feel snappy enough. Hover over the edge of the timeline canvas so that a white line appears along it. You'll also see a white double-ended arrow appear next to the edge by your imp. When you see this, grab the edge of the canvas with X. Move your imp to shorten the timeline to one second. Make sure you don't select the trim button by mistake. It's a square button by the numbers at the top of the timeline. It has a black arrow on it. The timeline duration is now correct, but the space is very small. So let's zoom in a bit. Hover your imp over the timeline canvas, hold L1, and press the right directional button to zoom in. This will keep the timeline duration to one second long, but stretch the space so that you can fit more detail into it. If you need to zoom out, just hold L1 and press the left directional button. Now let's put our slam attack keyframe onto the timeline. Grab the keyframe with R2 and place it at the start of the timeline canvas. Make sure you've got the slam keyframe and not the crouch one. The gadget automatically snaps to the surface of the canvas. The keyframe is only a fraction of a second long at the moment, but we need it to fill the length of the timeline. So hover over the keyframe and hold the up directional button to scale it. Make it the same length as the timeline. Now we want to wire the timeline up to a button press, just like we did with the crouch. Move the timeline canvas so that you can see the controller sensor and the timeline gadget. Open the controller sensor tweak menu with L1 and square. I'm going to use L1 as the slam attack button. Hover over the output port of the L1 button and press X to create a wire. Stretch the wire down to the timeline gadget and connect it to the power port on the bottom. You can now use the L1 button to perform Connie's slam attack. Give it a try and play to the power port on the bottom. You can now use the L1 button to perform Connie's slam attack. Give it a try in play mode. At the moment, it's just an animation, so it's not going to do anything to the blocks. But in the next step, I'll show you how to add some force to it. When you're ready to continue, return to edit mode, rewind time, and start the next step. The slam attack animation is all set up, but it's not doing much besides looking cool. So we need to add a gadget to our timeline that will emit a force when Connie slams the ground. The gadget we're going to use for this is the force applier. Go to the assembly menu and open the gadgets menu. Find the movers and output menu and open it with X. The icon for the force applier looks like a gust of wind. Select it with X to equip it to your imp. I hope you've still got the timeline open. If not, open it with L1 and X. Stamp the force applier onto the timeline canvas below the keyframe. Press circle to unequip the force applier from your imp. The force applier isn't very strong by default, so we'll need to tweak it. To open its tweak menu, hover over the gadget, hold L1 and press square. At the top of the tweak menu is the force strength slider. Its icon is a beefy arm. Drag it all the way up to 100% using your imp. That will ensure the force emitted will overcome the gravity in the scene and the friction between the blocks. 
Next, increase the force speed to 10 meters per second. That will give the slam attack some punch. If you take a look at Connie, you'll see a green zone around her. Anything in this zone will be affected by the force applier. At the moment, the zone isn't much bigger than Connie. Hover your imp over the zone and arrow gizmos will appear. Grab them with R2 and move your imp to change the size of the zone. Or, you can scale the zone more precisely in the force applier tweak menu. Go to the tab called Zone Size. Grab the Zone Size slider with X and set it to about 3.5 meters. OK, let's test out Connie's new powers. Switch over to Play Mode. Possess Connie and give her a new Slam Attack a try. Oops! Looks like it's more power than Connie can handle. The force applier is pushing her off the platform. Switch back to edit mode and rewind time. In the final step, I'll show you how to tweak the force applier so that it only affects the objects we want it to. To prevent the force applier from pushing Connie off the platforms, we're going to use labels. Scope back into Connie and open up her microchip. Open the timeline canvas with L1 and X. Now tweak the force applier with L1 and square. Labels can be given to any object in the scene, and gadgets like the force supplier can detect them. In the force supplier tweak menu, go to the labels tab. By default, it will detect all labels. There are labels for all sorts of objects, foes, scenery, targets. The friend label is used for playable characters like Connie, or friendly characters like Cuthbert. So if we deselect it, the force applier will no longer affect Connie. Hover over the friend button and press X to deselect it. It's the button with the heart icon. Now Connie should be able to blast through the blocks without firing herself off into space. Use her new skills to pass all the obstacles. And you can use your new skills to create some characters for your scenes. When you've successfully rescued Cuthbert, go through the door to finish this tutorial.
I'm Mark, Creative Director of Media Molecule, and I'm going to present a simple masterclass that will hopefully help you use some of what so far and turn that into an entire game. We're going to be focusing on a remix of the Dreamiverse Dash game. That means take a copy of something, mess around with it, which is always a really good way to learn. I will be reiterating some of the basics that you may have already learnt, but basics make for strong foundations and strong foundations make for strong structures yes so um first of all try playing the game get familiar with it and when you get past the finish line we'll dive in and start tinkering What? This side is thinner. Okay. Oh, right. Mm, wow. What if I keep going? This one? Oh, oh fuck. This one? Oh, oh my god. That was dumb. Okay, let's start by making sure we feel comfortable navigating the space. So here's a quick reminder of how we do this. If you feel you're already a master at camera controls, then you can skip this step. Use the left stick to move forwards, backwards, left or right. Use the right stick to look in a different direction. If I hold down L1, I can now use the left stick to move up and down instead of forward and backward. We use the L1 button a lot to alter the functionality of other buttons, what? much like a shift key on a computer. Hello, I'm Karim, Art Director of Media Molecule. Today I will be doing a sculpture masterclass. I'll be modeling a male bust and uh, going through uh, basic modeling techniques 
to block the general form of the sculpture and build up to more detailed techniques and more sculptural uh, 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 philosophies and attitudes to find your own personal style in dream. I hope you find it inspiring for you to start sculpting and find your own style in dreams. And now we begin sculpting our head. The first phase is to block out the general shape of all the head and bust components. Here we go. This is a sculpture pedestal that I've made earlier for the purpose of this tutorial. Also, I've made the space around us and put in it some of my favorite sculptures for inspiration and reference. I've also pre-lit it with nice lights to help us sculpt in a nice atmosphere. Before we start the sculpture, I would like to recap that it's very important to have learned the camera controls. In the dream tutorials, you will find tutorials just focusing on the camera controls and tells you all about the different nuances of it. The most important one is the grab cam, where pressing your move button on your primary controller will grab the point in space that your imp tip is over. This is the imp tip on top of the imp here. So if I put my imp wherever I want to go, press the move button, pull myself towards that point or push myself away, you see that the camera is moving accordingly. It's very important to have practiced this in order to proceed with the sculpt tutorial. There is also other features in the camera, like makes you zoom in right close to an area in order to detail. I would recommend that you practice using the camera controls now, and when you feel confident in them, click the arrow on the video to go to the next step. The first thing I'm going to do is open my sculpt menu by pressing the T button on my secondary controller. I will pick the modes and choose the sculpt mode. Sculpt mode defaults on shapes. The shape I'm going to start with is the sphere shape. When I start pressing my T button on my primary controller, I can smear my shape continuously like that. This is the tool that sculpt mode defaults in. Instead, I'm going to change to Stamp Shape tool, which allows me to stamp singular stamps of my chosen shape. This is the tool I'm going to start with in my sculpture. Now I need to stretch my sphere shape. To do that, I'll use Form. I tap my two controllers together, which puts me into the Form state. Once I'm happy with that, I press the T button on the secondary controller to lock the shape that I've stretched. Something like that. Now I need to turn on some guides to help me place my first edits. To do that, I will open my menu again, press the guide menu and select the stay upright guide. Pressing that fixes my shape to upright position only and doesn't go in any other orientation. By pressing the second toggle beside it, it allows it to only rotate by 90 degrees only, like this. The next guide I'd like to enable from the start of my sculpture is the mirror guide. This allows me to work in symmetry, which is very useful for modeling ahead. To do that, I will go to the guides, enable it, and this activates the mirror guide which places a copy of every edit I do. This is very useful in modeling ahead. You can see the mirror plane as well is drawn in the center. I will switch that off because I prefer modeling without. Now to place my first stamp, I'd like to get my two mirrored copies exactly aligned on top of one another. To do that, I try to get that center line align as much as I can. When I do that, I press the T button on the primary controller to place my edit. For the second edit for the back of the head, I will turn my shape by 90 degrees and 
intersect with the front of the head. I would like to also blend that shape onto the first one more softly. To do that, I will activate one of our other features called the soft blend. To soft blend, I press the square button on my secondary controller and twist my hand like that. This allows my shape to blend with the previous shape in a softer way. And when I'm happy with the blend amount, I press the T button on my primary controller to stamp my shape like that. Move on to the next step when you're ready. The back of the head is a little bit too long. To modify the shape, I go to my stretch tool, grab the back of the head, and move it inward like that. Now I need to change to subtract, to suggest the Joe shape. To do that, I will pick a different shape, the Q, and press this button up here to change to subtract. This allows me to cut out shapes instead of adding them. There is also a shortcut to toggle between adding and subtracting, like that. From now on, I will be using this shortcut. I place my cube at the bottom of the head to cut the Joe shape, and I need to scale this cube up a little bit. To do that, I use the control scale, which is pressing the button the circle button on the secondary controller and twisting my hand upwards like that makes my shape bigger or smaller. Notice that the guides, the upright guides are still on, which makes my shapes still upright. I'll do this first cut here for the first shape and then go on the back of the head to create the back of the jaw shape. Always remember to press the move button and move your camera around to keep examining your edits that they are what you need them to be just like I'm doing here this is roughly what I'm looking for then I press the T button now the shape of the head is starting to form when you're happy with your shape move on to the next step now I would like to exit my sculpture, I'll open my menu again and start a new sculpture. Pick the cylinder shape. You don't have to get the shape or the size of the cylinder right from the start. I'll just stamp it around the right position. I I'll pick back my stretch tool to stretch that cylinder into the right size. Stretch it from the top and from the bottom. The next thing I will do is pick another shape, the sphere shape, another time, and stretch it using the form gesture into an ellipse shape, like this. Scale it up, and remember I need to be in the stamp tool, not the smear tool. Now I can soft blend the shape into the cylinder and do another stamp on the side for the shoulders. This is roughly the shape of the upper body and the neck. I will exit the sculpture again, and now I will position and scale the two pieces of my sculpture to get the right proportions. I've switched off my upright guide, and now using the cut tool, and turning the upright guide back on to get a clean cut at the bottom for my bust. I got the shape of the top part now and the bottom part of my sculpture. I keep toggling between turning upright off and on for the purposes of the cuts being straight or not. Now I've switched it off. I don't really need it anymore for the work we're doing. I'm now going to scale and move my two pieces around till I just get them relatively a good proportion to each other. I selected the two together by using my X button and selecting the two, and now I can just move them both. To realign any shape, 
I just select it and while holding my T button, I press triangle to realign it. So this is a good tip to know. Scoping back into the bottom section again, without the upright guide on anymore, and now I can tilt the neck cylinder a little bit to the front. Exit the sculpture again. This stage is all about trying to get a good relationship between the two pieces so I can start my next stage of sculpture. And now I'd like to re-enter my sculpture and pick the cylinder shape, use it to cut the eye socket using a little bit of soft blend in that cut as well. The eye socket is normally around the center distance of that front egg shape of the head. I'll pick this cylinder again and scale it up to do a cut for the tapering of the side of the head with a little soft blend on it as well. Move on to the next step when you're satisfied. Now to do the basic shapes for the nose, mouth, and chin. For the nose, I'll pick a cube and stretch it again using into this shape. Place it between the two eye grooves that we've done earlier. Use a little bit of soft blend by dialing it up and placing that edit. Again, I can move my edit after the fact using the move tool, just to get it more perfect. That's the basic shape I need for the nose. Edit by to this shape. Place it between the two eye grooves that we've done earlier. Use a little bit of soft blend by dialing it up and placing that edit. Again, I can move my edit after the fact using the move tool just to get it more perfect. That's the basic shape I need for the nose. To do the mouth shape, the mouth or the lips usually sit on top of what we call the mouth barrel, which is a big protruded edit by to this shape. Place it between the two eye grooves that we've done earlier. Use a little bit of soft blend by dialing it up and placing that edit. Again, I can move my edit after the fact using the move tool just to get it more perfect. That's the basic shape I need for the nose. To do the mouth shape, the mouth or the lips usually sit on top of what we call the mouth barrel, which is a big protruded muscle area around the lips. It usually goes until the middle of the eye socket. I will use a cylinder to do the top part like that and use a little bit of soft blend to blend it with the face. This gives me the first top half of the mouth and then a smaller cylinder at the bottom to do the bottom section of the mouth. This is sort of a combination of the muscles and lips around this area simplified to the basic form. To do the chin, we'll use the sphere shape and place it at the bottom of the head right there and dial up a little bit of soft blend again to blend it a bit with the head shape. Like that. Move on to the next step when you're done.
<laughs> and now I need to do a little modification to the jaw to make it have the right proportion. So basically, if you imagine a line that comes from the middle of the mouth till the side here, this is where the jaw should end. So all this bit extra at the bottom is a little extra. This is a, a, a guide to know the relationship between the mouth and that edge or the corner of the jaw. So we just take a little bit off using a cut from the base of the cylinder with a little bit of soft blend and it's more convincing or more uh, elegant uh, shape. This is where it should be from these two axes. Now to do a little indentation in the skull, which we always get in the human skull, I will use a sphere and flatten it to do that indentation. I will try to get the flattened sphere as close as possible to the kind of shape I want to scoop out of the head. But rather than doing it in a very sharp cut like that, again, I will turn on a little bit of soft blend to do a softer indentation. I just move my hands in and out till I get the relative position that I want. I notice that my head is starting to take shape now and the back of the head needs a tiny stretch still to make it slightly smaller. So I get my stretch tool and do that. Now for the ears, I will use the sphere again. Reselecting the shape, by the way, from the menu res re restores it again to its default uniform shape. I'll stretch my sphere shape to try to get the flat sphere that I want to do the ear. Again, the ear size is roughly from the start of the brow till the bottom of the nose or the base of the nose that's kind and the positioning of it is starts there and ends there we put it on the side where the jaw finishes and then i'll get my stretch tool again and give it a little bit more width going back to the move tool to keep repositioning it and i turn a lot the camera around to try to get that positioning as successful as possible it's very important to look at the ears from the front to see that it's the right angle and the ears usually protrude out a little bit like that so much easier to work with just a sphere than a complex ear sculpture so we try to get the general decisions as correct as possible will make the specific detail much easier to do. I do another sphere cut to do the general groove of the ear. And it's very important not to get carried away with detail at this point in the sculpture. Just three edits to make the ear. One big one, the cut, and a little one there for the little bit at the bottom of the ear. I'll place it down here to get reasonable shape of the ear going. And always examine my sculpture, have a look at it from all directions, and make sure that everything looks reasonably cohesive and consistent. When you're ready, move on to the next step.
see what I'm doing. What the hell? Is it a puppet? Oh, no way. What? Wow. Holy shit.
case you can crunch. Oh shit. It's not very What is what is the demon mode? Attack, jump, tongue mode, focus. Oh, this is at the bottom. <laughs> that is focus right there. Oh shit! Actually, it looks really good. thing maybe not maybe it's gonna kill me instead Let's see. Okay. Okay, very nice. Very cool touch. The little okay. Now what is this? this is, okay. Uh, I mean it looks really cool. Oh, uh, okay. And it's timed. That's cool. Skill up, Bob. Okay. This is Spider Man. Oh. 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 Okay. Oh. How do you? Oh, let's look at the. Can you climb on the walls? Oh, what am I doing? Okay. Wow. That's 
pretty neat. All right. Okay. All oh, great. Very cool. Oh, they have a Spider-Man in here. It's a, is it a good Spider-Man? What the fuck? Iron Man. Liar. Oh my god, what does he do? Sounds like a vacuum cleaner. Oh shit, what am I doing? Okay. You know what, Spider-Man can't get me from up here on this building. It almost pulled off my head. Okay. God. building over there. Look at that building in the middle of the street. What is that all about anyway? What's that noise? What? I hear a noise. Wait, what is this here for? Oh my god, what the fuck is that? Um... What the hell is this? What the fuck you want, Iron Man? Spider-Man died. Break him. He, he broke him. Fall damage? weird. Cool. 
creepy. They're cool. I mean, he's already dead. Rich duck. <laughs> 